Okay, the topic of my presentation today is the importance of fit new quality assurance and biosecurity program. I'm going to start off by first looking at the need for quality, consistency and fit hygiene. Then we will learn more about raw material quality program in a fit meal, which involves setting up some ingredient standards and why it's necessary to have the program or standards. This chart shows us the various reasons why there's a need for quality, consistency and fit hygiene. We know that around the globe, there have been growing demand for healthy foods by consumers. This is becoming more and more important as many people are getting more health conscious. This usually deal with issues such as food contamination, use of antibiotics in animal feeds as an antimicrobial resistant, as well as the environment. This development is also driven very much by the public media, social networks, animal welfare, or activists, and so forth. And we are now seeing governments around the world starting to ban or restrict the use of antibiotics in feed. Even at the feed meals, safety and biosecurity are becoming important. This is especially applicable to those feed meal workers who need to handle various chemicals and medication all the time. This chart here summarizes the chicken meat supply chain in the broiler industry. It begins at the feed mill where poultry feeds are produced. The feeds are then supplied either to the breeding farm or directly to the grow up farms. The chicks after hatching from the hatchery will be sent to the grow up farm for rally. And when the birds are ready to be harvested, the chicken are then sent to processing plant for further processing, or in some cases, the chicken are sent directly to wholesalers, retailers, supermarkets, and restaurants. Otherwise, the processing plant supply the meat to the restaurant, supermarkets, and, and retailers. All these processes need to ensure safety and hygiene of chicken meat products, as well as the people involved in the industry. Furthermore, poultry producer expect consistent quality and hygienic feeds from the feed meal. For example, let's say you take pellet quality uh, of feed. If the pellet quality is poor, the broiler performance will suffer. And with the breeders, the breeder uniformity, body weight control can be influenced by variation or changes in crude protein of the finished feeds. And same goes for eggshell quality. It can be affected by incorrect calcium, phosphorus ratio, as well as vitamin D in the feed. Therefore, feed need to be consistent in quality and safe and clean, free from pathogenic bacteria, such as Salmonella, E. coli, and Clostridium. Now let's look closer at how feeds are normally produced in the feed meal. Here are the common steps 
involved. After the nutritionist or the formulator finish with a formula, that formula is sent to the feed mill. At the feed mill, there are different processes going on, even before the formula arrives, like grinding of raw material before uh, prior to, and before that, raw material selection, raw material intake and storage, grinding, I mentioned, as well as weighing, mixing, or we call batching. And then the feed will be heat treated through a conditioner and then pelleting. And then the pelleted feed need to be cooled down in the process of cooling. After that, the finished feed will be either stored at the feed mill or sent out to the customers or to various places. In terms of what raw materials are selected and used in a feed mill, obviously this depends on what are available in the local area and at what prices. Corn or maize is the primary grain or energy source for much of the world. However, some regions like uh, Australia, New Zealand and Europe use wheat. Sorghum and other grains such as rice are also used in some parts of the world. In terms of protein sources, the common ones are soybean meal, canola meal, meat and bone meal, and in some countries, peanut meal. There are also many byproducts produced by the human food or agricultural processing industries, which depend on the animal feed industry to use. For example, oil seeds from sunflower, from canola, cotton, full fat soy, and corn byproducts, such as uh, corn cluder meal, uh, DDGS. In terms of meat meal, there are different byproducts from beef and pork and lamb, poultry, and fish meal as well. And regard to fats, they are animal fats, poultry fat, and fat from vegetables, from uh, things like soya, canola, and corn, and many others. So we ask the question again, why the need for a quality program in a feed meal? Well, to answer that question, we need to discuss a bit on QC versus QA. The term QC or quality control actually refers to the individual control efforts. It's designed to remove defects or mistakes only after they have been allowed to occur or happen that is control at the end of the process. On the other hand, quality assurance or QA is a overall program or system of controls. The program tries to make sure that acceptable quality is produced in the first place and then maintained throughout the various critical steps of the production process. So the emphasis here with QA is on doing right the first time. Okay, so you see the difference here. You try to address the problem only after the problem happened. With QA, you try to make sure that you do the right thing as the first time so that mistake will not happen. The first critical aspect of a QA program is raw material quality assurance. This is because a good quality feed cannot be made from poor quality raw materials. It's as simple as that, but very important. 
one of the main reasons we need raw material quality assurance is because of resistance of ingredient variations or differences. When a feed mill receives a shipment of grain, like corn, they may have been coming from different number of sources or regions. The nutrient content can be quite different depending where they come from. And usually they cannot be segregated or separated according to the nutrient levels at the feed mill due to what we call storage constraints. In many feed mills, there are simply not enough uh, holding bees. As you can see from this chart here, there could be significant variations in nutrient content of different batches of ingredients due to a number of factors. This may consist of country of origins, the type of soil that, and whether fertilizer are used, storage condition, and also different seasons, weather condition, even the method used to process uh, grains or beans. And also the lab analysis technique use could be different between different labs and so forth. And here, to give you some examples of variation in four different ingredients in terms of protein and moisture range. You can see here corn protein can vary from seven and a half to 11 and a half percent. The moisture from 11 and a half to 14.5. Wheat can also vary uh, quite a lot in protein and moisture, as you can see here. And the meat meal variation is even larger, 44 to 66% in protein, and from as low as 0.7% moisture to as high as 14%. And the same goes for DDGS, as you can see here. If you look at the colors of the DGS, you see the different, the three different uh, variation. It, the, the differences are quite obvious, isn't it? So this is probably overcooked, and this one here is probably undercooked during the processing. And soya bean meal a very common protein source. This table here shows the results of tests done on soybean meal collected from four different countries on various nutrients or parameters. All samples are analyzed at the same lab by the same technician to avoid any uh, technical errors. You can see that depending on which country soybean meal comes from, the, the content of crude protein, fat, energy, fiber, lysine content, and so forth, can be quite different. If you compare, for example, Indian soybean meal, the energy is low compared to those from USA or Argentina or from Brazil. See the lysine content also. And can vary between different countries. As mentioned before, raw material quality standards are the first line of control in a feed QA program, which form the basis of all ingredients purchasing contract. So the company standards need to have at least some basic ingredient specifications, the number minimum a protein or maximum moisture level that are acceptable to the company, as well as what I call intake procedure guidelines. These guidelines are for 
the staff who are responsible for accepting those incoming ingredients, which I will speak a bit, a bit more later about that. It's relevant to say here that for those who have breeder farms, that the high value of GP, grandparent stock and parent stock, and even their cheeks, require high quality ingredient choices. So you shouldn't try to uh, use low or poor quality products for them because it's not worth it. The intake procedure guidelines. These are the guidelines are for staff, as I mentioned. And there are three parameters or criteria that should be considered for setting and assessing ingredient quality standards. You can see here, these are physical, chemical, and biological. Now in terms of physical, uh, the general appearance, bulk density, particle size, the color, the smell, and things like foreign wheat seed, lumps, or any contaminants. So that under physical. Uh, in terms of chemical, moisture, protein, fiber, fat, and all different nutrients can be analyzed. In terms of biological, we can do mycotoxin tests, tests for salmonella, E. coli, and and other bacteria. Now, what happened when the uh, ingredients arrive at the feed mill? So, upon arrival at the feed mill, the ingredients should be properly uh, sampled and inspected, and then uh, assessed in accordance with procedures as already documented in the receiver guideline I mentioned early on. And deliveries which fail to meet the pre-specified standards for that product should be reported immediately to the manager or to uh, the purchasing department. And that a, a decision has to be made, okay? Please note that under the company ingredient quality standards, deliveries that fail to meet that specified standard should be rejected, okay, should be rejected. This is very important as you have to let your supplier know you are serious about ingredient quality because if you're not serious, they will find out soon. They will not try to sell, send you the good ingredients. They will send you the lousy one. So you need to be really uh, tell them you are serious about quality and they will not try to play around with you. This one here, just an example of what a basic quality standards for soya bean meal. And this is the uh, US uh, standard. You can see protein, whether it's dehal or non dehal you should have a minimum standard, minimum protein level. And so it goes for fat, fiber, and the maximum moisture that you're allowed to come in in your feed meal. And also another criteria is anti-kicking agent. Now at the feed mill, the quality of incoming ingredients can be assessed with the use of different tools. Besides the use of our human eyes, nose, hands, the, for different physical quality, such as already described the color, the texture, the smell, there should be some ingredient reference samples at the fit meal so that you can compare between good and bad. 
Some other useful tools are uh, spear probes, which used to collect samples and sieves, and also a tool called chondrometer. This one is the use to measure bulk density of ingredients. The other one is near infrared deflectance machine, usually called NR machine. Now, NR machine or analyzer can uh, rapidly, reliably test for protein, moisture, fat, and ash. So it's very quick, and I think it's an essential for any feed meal. So if you don't have feed at our machine, then something is not right. And uh, with new technology these days, in future or even now, NIR can uh, have the ability to analyze things like metab uh, metabolizable energy, amino acid, digestibility, and other nutritional uh, parameters. In the feed meal, it's important to pay attention to uh, producing good pellet quality. As I mentioned before, poor quality of the pellet can result in the occurrence of what we call dust or fines, which can have negative effect on feed intake of broilers. As can be seen from the chart here, the more fines here uh, in the feed, the poorer is the live weight gain, the poorer is the feed conversion. Now let's move on to another important area in a feed meal, the feed meal biosecurity program. Now actually having a biosecurity program in a feed meal is actually quite simple or straightforward. First, you need to have a company uh, policy that should take account of setting up uh, some standard operating procedures, SOP, or in some uh, section called GMP, which is Good Manufacturing Practices. And these are for each of the different section of the fit meal. Then comes the implementation part. Then the training of staff member. All these involve processes of uh, process verification, inspection, and record keeping. Somewhat like the HACCP or ISO programs those who are familiar with. Now, in a feed meal, having a GMP or SOP, the personal hygiene should be the top priority. The company should provide, for example, all the necessary facilities, such as like uh, lockers to store personal effects, like handphones, like watchers, and also important to have facilities for washing hands, as well as uh, appropriate signage like this, notices that are clearly posted to reinforce that practices that you have put in place. And uh, the other one is developing what I call a personnel cleanliness protocol. And this comes with a training that specifies certain expectation regarding to hand washing, uh, whether you are allowed to wear uh, jewelry in the feed meal, whether you're allowed to carry uh, your cell phone and other equipment as well. So it's important to specify that. Now, this is just a checklist of uh, what I call a biosecurity checklist. You can see the different things that you should check. Like you should have a visitor policy and 
product integrity, housekeeping, and employer selection and training, and you have an emergency response policy. What happened if the feed you sent to the farm had con have mistakes and you need to recall the feeds? So you need to already have some policy in place. And the other thing is about controlling the people, the workers or the visitors. There should be no access allowed to outsiders. Signboards like this should be clearly posted where appropriate around the feed mill. Should be clear that the people preventive control is important to your company. One area that is now becoming more important, at least in many developed countries, is biological hazards or threat in poultry feeds, especially control, controlling salmonella. Poultry feeds that are contaminated with salmonella can cause illness if they come into direct contact with humans and contaminated feet can cause uh, illness or infections in chickens that consume the feet. So in terms of controlling, minimizing hazard and response, similarly, you can see here that it involves uh, proper raw material selection and medication or decontamination in the feed meal and ingredients of animal origin and processed vegetable proteins are high risk and this source and use in breeder feed should be carefully considered. In fact, we encourage uh, feed meal not to use the animal products especially in breeder feeds. And the other uh, important area is what we, uh, heat treatment and then chemical treatment. There are different methods used to uh, uh, use for feed decontamination in a feed mill. One is the heat treatment. The other one is the use of moderate strength organic acids, as well as use of more powerful chemicals like formaldehyde or mixture of acid and formaldehyde. In terms of heat treatment, the free ideally should be heated to 86 degrees for as long as six minutes for effective kill of bacteria. And this is actually averaging recommendation. And then feed has to be handled in the biosecurity manner after treatment, as feed can be recontaminated because there's no residual effect or benefit. So monitoring of the environment in the feed meal should also be part of a monitoring program. Because if, sorry, if, feed, uh, if heat treatment is not fully effective, salmonella can survive in a damaged state and repair and growth of damage. Salmonella can happen in the poultry house and can reach an infective dose. So you, you do want to see that happening. Under chemical treatment, it has a major benefit compared to the heat treatment, that it has a potential residual benefit that can provide protection through delivery and at the farm. Whereas heat treatment feed can get recontaminated. Now controlling the incoming and going out of vegas are another important area or feed meal. 
this picture show the disinfection process. To prevent cross-contamination during loadout and delivery, attention has to be given to the flushing of trucks and sequ proper sequencing in the loadout beams, and also the sequencing should be done according to uh, from low to high risk deliveries and from clean to dirty farms. And drivers uh, should use protective uh, food wear, such as this shown here, when entering uh, at the feed mill and at the farm as well. In fact, strictly speaking, truck drivers should never enter poultry houses or even farm office, except in case of an emergency. And you should consider having dedicated feed transport vehicles for feed to breeder farms, separate from, say, broiler feeds. And you have to wash, disinfect, dry uh, the trucks before moving up the biosecurity pyramid. And delivery feed trucks should preferably not enter the farm. Instead, feed should be palm or auger from outside, from the farm gate. As you can see from this picture, the silo are actually outside the fence. So the truck would not need to enter into the farm area. And if you uh, produce feed that are bagged, and uh, there are still many places where feeds are bagged after they are made. If so, there are a few things you need to consider. Well, the, the, the bagging area should be internal, inside what I call the clean area in the feed mill. And there should be proper uh, fueling, weighing, sealing, labeling, and stacking. And uh, you should automate the bagging process and because it will reduce the use of people or human and because human can involve uh, contamination. And uh, you should consider uh, adopting some advanced technology like barcoding so that you can do some tracing if you need to. And the use of what we, we call double bagging uh, using uh, polyethylene liners, you should be consider that as well. Mm -hmm. So the double bag with the outer bag being plastic or the polyethylene and then at the farm, the bags, the outside can be sprayed with disinfectant and then the bag, the outer bag can be removed and then the inner bag can be used inside the farm. Lastly, but not the least, pest control. Highly significant. This covers controlling of rodents or rats and the birds. These pets can carry with them harmful bacteria and viruses, both harmful to human and to the animals or to the poultry. This pest control should ideally be conducted by the professionals. That is the use of a pest control company. So even when you use a uh, the professional by the pest control company, those companies should be licensed or approved. And they have uh, safety uh, information, uh, what we call MSDS on the product use or pest control. And 
after the each visit, they should come or uh, give you a written report what jobs have been done. So it's very important. So in conclusions, we look at those uh, current circumstances in the media, consumer demand for healthy and antibiotic free meat and other uh, associated factors that driven feed meals to produce feed that consistently meet the highest quality and hygiene standards. Feed production is a complex process. Every care should be given in every aspect of the manufacturing process. An effective QA program includes practically nearly every activity and every level of management and requires dedication and continuous improvement on the different teams of a feed producer. Much is simply good policy, housekeeping, monitoring and maintenance, SOP, GMP, as I talk about, as well as ongoing staff training. Feed meal biosecurity is important but it's a process that involves many people within that complex system. And a weak link in the biosecurity process is cross-contaminated feeds. So the number one goal then is to prevent contamination from happening in the first place. So you need to have the QA program. I talk about. All right, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, welcome to our webinar where today we will be talking about supporting laying hens through feed and management practices with a focus on the reduction of antibiotic usage. When it comes to reducing antibiotics in our hens, it's quite obvious we need to start with a healthy hen. Our problem is that they may look healthy on the outside, but we never really know what's going on inside, often until it's too late. Here in the UK, 60% of our flocks are free range, and these are normal conditions we have to contend with. Yet still, we've managed to reduce our overall antibiotic usage by 80% over seven years. And in laying hens, we have a target of a total bird day usage of 1%. And currently in the UK, we are operating around half a percent. So how did we do this? How did we reduce the reliance we find on antibiotics? Well, the first stage is we need to use them more effectively. This is a standard production profile. What we generally do is when we experience challenges is we then treat with antibiotics. And often when those challenges return, we have to retreat and retreat. This is a very reactive method. And over time, we see a reduction in the efficacy of the treatments. So we need to be more strategic in how we use them. And we find that when we use strategic treatments, effective treatments, we actually will use less antibiotics. Because we need to remember that the antibiotics are there to help the hen. We're not trying to replace the hen's ability to fight its own challenge. We need to work with the hen. So when we want to be effective, we need to work a little bit closer with our veterinarians in coming up with treatment programs. The second stage is what it comes down to. We need to promote a healthy immune system. This is how we have a healthy hen. And we do this through the provision 
of a balanced gut microbiota. How do we get there? We do this by, we use a high quality feed that meets the nutritional demands of the hen through all stages. We need to meet developmental markers through body weight and uniformity targets. And we need to provide a sufficient environment for the hens to achieve all of these markers we set out. And the focus always comes back to the immune system and how we can provision the balanced gut microbiota. Even in production, we know a well-developed hen will always be able to resist the onslaught of challenge and improve their recovery times. And this is important to us. Again, if we look at a basic profile, and here we have a production challenge. Often, sometimes, if the hen is struggling to recuperate, we can see a long, slow recovery. What we need is a fast recovery because there's a huge cost differential here. This is going to cost us a lot of money the longer they take to recover. And there are many factors that help with the fast recovery. Again, the use of veterinary people our management skills we can use. But ultimately, the effectiveness of all of these factors rely on the strength of the immune system and the body weight and uniformity profile. We are always relying on that progress of that hen. Now, our influence on all of this begins on day one. This is where we begin to influence the immune system. We have some control now. And we need to do this by stimulating the digestive tract and encouraging the chick to take on feed and water. So these practices we implement from day one have far reaching consequences, not just in rear, but throughout production. So getting them eaten and drinking is the most important first step in helping develop the immune system. So for the first five days of life, the chick will utilize the remaining yolk residue it has as a food source. Now, this doesn't last forever, but the residual yolk also provides the essential maternal antibodies that the chick needs to help develop the immune system. So it's important we utilize this correctly and efficiently. However, this is a limited resource, and it only provides 10 to 20% of all the dietary energy and proteins we need for these first few days. So we need to stimulate the digestive tract through environmental controls and feeding stimulation. So we essentially are providing support during this essential growing period. But what is the right environment? For the chicks. Let's look. A young chick cannot regulate its own body temperature until they are around four or five days old. We call this a poikilotherm. So they are entirely reliant on the environment, the external environment that we are providing. So an ideal temperature for us, it's around five to six degrees lower than the chick's own body temperature, which is 40 to 41 degrees. So in a cage, we will look at a 35 degree ambient temperature. Um, on a floor system, a floor rearing system, we will look around 36 degree ambient temperature. But the floor temperature is also important, and we often neglect checking the temperature on the floor but it's important both in a cage or in floor rearing. We need to remember the chick is a lot closer to the floor when we are, than we are. So if it's too cold, they will lose heat out of their feet. And the natural reaction then is to lie down. Once they do this, they put a larger surface area on the floor and they can lose even more 
of this body temperature. So we need to make sure it's a nice, comfortable environment, around 28 to 30 degrees, depending on the floor substrate we provide. Humidity is also important in these first few days because we need to prevent the heat loss we get through panting. So we aim to maintain around 60 to 70% relative humidity the first few days. The easiest way to check the environmental temperature is through taking cloacal temperature. Because again, we need to remember, when we talk about environment, it's not about the environment that we feel, it's the environment that the chicks feel. We can use here, this is a simple ear thermometer. What we need to do, we said before, the average body temperature is between 40 and 41 degrees. Using the ear thermometer, we can test every day for the first few days. Make sure we're recording these findings. From those numbers, we can calculate an average temperature of the chicks. And from this, we can then decide if we need to adjust the overall house temperature within the production, uh, the rearing facility. Water should always be clean and flushed before and during use, particularly in hot climates. We know how water heats up in the system and we don't need water sitting in there. So we need to try and maintain a water temperature between 20 to 25 degrees. When we position the drinkers early, we want to make sure the birds are looking up at the nipple. They still obviously need to be able to reach, but when a bird drinks, we need to make sure it can reach. Initially, the pressure should be low enough to so little droplets on the nipples. This helps attract the chicks because they're interested by the droplet. Sometimes actually placing a chick near the water itself will encourage others to drink. And we need to remember to test the water regularly. It's very important we test not just the quality of the water, but also the pH of the water. Crop checking. Crop checking is a great tool. And we use it generally to ascertain feeding behavior in a new flock. So how do we do it? Select a random chick, feel the crop. You should feel a round full sack. Mark it on a recording sheet and simply repeat for at least 50 chicks, depending on the size of your establishment. Calculate the average. Why do we calculate the average? Well, if we look on housing in rear, after around four hours, we expect 50% of those hens that we check to have a full crop. As we move on to say a full day, we expect to see 85% of those hens with a full crop. By the time we get to a full day in an evening, a full 24 hour period, we expect to see all of those hens taking on that food. And this is how we can check the efficacy of our environment. Now, crop checking is not just a useful tool for the early days, but also for the whole life of the flock. Even in production, if I walk into a facility around feeding time and we check the birds, we should always check the crop so we can see if our feeding regime is suitable. A high light intensity also for those first few days will help the chicks find food and water. And we can use simple light meters like these. And really we want between 30 and 40 looks for those first few days. A nice bright environment, a lot of light over those feeding areas so they can see, they can explore. See, there are many, many important developmental stages in rear. We see organ development, skeletal development, feed intake capacities, 
And what we often do is we throw further challenges at the hens through this time with vaccination programs, etc. So we really put a lot of pressure throughout these very important periods of development. And the best tool we have to monitor development are body weights. And it's actually one tool that we often underuse. It's so simple to do. And we need to be taking body weights from day one until at least week 32 into production while the birds are developing. Remember when we take a bird from rearing into production, it is still in its rearing phase. Weigh again around 10% of the chicks or in cages, uh, in cage rear, five to six random cages. Rand randomization helps us get a better overall picture. And always calculate the uniformity. Uniformity of the flock is just as important as the body weights. Because body weights are directly related to production and mortality. This is an example. If we take four key developmental markers, so we look at persistency of lay at 68 to 72 weeks. Many people now in production go way beyond the 72 weeks. Livability, mortality at 60 weeks and 72 weeks, very important. We want the well-developed strong hens. We need them to live and produce throughout that period. And the total leg numbers over the 72 weeks. So if we look at a low, medium and high correlation, as the bird goes on, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we see this correlation growing and growing. And by the time we get to five weeks, there's a high correlation with all these key developmental markers. So it's imperative we meet the body weight targets at those ages. As the bird then progress further through rear, we can see it gets older, we get to 10, 12 weeks, again, important developmental markers we see. Then we get to week 16 and we need this uniformity. Uniformity, we're going into production and we need to look at a one hen concept because all of our decisions are based on one average. So we need to try and make sure the uniformity is at least 80% in our flock, if not higher. Because poor uniformity, to me, is similar to when we use a high stocking density. We, we can have many negative implications. Now, in Europe, you can see on the bottom here, we now have to use enriched colony. So we have 750 square centimetres per hen, a large area. We also have to provide scratch mats, nest areas, and perch bars within these colony cages where in uh, many countries in the rest of the world, even 450 centimetres, which to me is probably a, a minimum, is still a high number. Many people are still under that uh, measurement. But the reason they are so closely related is because poor uniformity and the high stock intensity, both of them can compromise the intake ability of the flock. This can lead to a potential nutritional imbalance, which affects the whole flock performance. And remember, we previously mentioned how important the nutrition is in obtaining an effective gut microbiota. The risk of disease transference is increased in high stock intensities due to the proximity of hens. So this ability to spread from a challenge grows and when we have poor uniformity, it's a lot easier for some of the weaker birds to succumb to disease a little bit quicker, a little bit easier, and then we increase the spread of those challenges. And also we can see increased stress responses in these situations. Um, birds still exhibit natural behaviors in cages. In fact, hens still dust bathe in cages. They still go through the motions. And when we restrict these natural behaviors, we increase the stress responses. Increased stress means the immune system 
becomes more compromised and this causes an imbalance in the gut flora. And we also get the reduced ability to utilize the micronutrients in the feed in the face of a challenge. When a bird is ill, we need to make sure more than any other time that they are taking in every nutrient, every amino acid, a fair share of everything they need to speed up this recovery. So as we can see, everything then comes back to nutrition, to feed, to the gut. So this is where I will now hand over to my colleague, Juan, who will talk more about the gut microbiota from a feeding perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. As you already mentioned, we never know what is happening inside the bird because the only thing we see is outside the bird. But in fact, there are many bacteria living in the gut of the hen. As you can see, there are different concentrations in the different parts of the intestinal tract. And especially in the cecum, you can see a higher amount of bacteria living there. But the point is not the amount of bacteria but it's, as always, the key between pathogenic flora and commercial flora, commercial flora, right? This balance can be disrupted by the diet, a low hygienical condition of the diet, a micro or microbiology of the diet, parasites, virus, water, and stress. From the very beginning, we need to take care of our pets because the immune and digestive system develops during the first three weeks of life of the bullet. And the good microbiota established or has been established between three and six weeks of life. This is a very important period where we can use any kind of additives that might support these functions on the bird. I mean, prebiotics, probiotics, organic acid, organic blends of acids, of acids Essential oils, etc. etc. This is a critical period. We need to establish the right microbiota, a good development, because the bird will have to carry on with this development for the whole life. Good health, any incidents with mycotoxins or digestive problems due to the undigestible substrates might trigger incidents like necrotic enteritis, coccidiosis, dysbiosis by worsen the uniformity of the flock. And we know that we have a very low uniformity or less uniformity in our flock. They for sure might impact in the further performance of the lying hen. When talking about the feed, we need to say, or we need to establish what is the right feed format for the bird. And the preferred one is the mash feed. Why? Because it's improving the gizzard development. And the gizzard is taking care of the grinding of the old materials, raw materials and the feed that the bird is eating. It improves the holding capacity and also improves the energy utilization and the nutrient digestibility. And remember that improving digestibility might reduce the amount of indigestible substances that might reach the hindgut and might provoke any dysbiosis or any imbalance in the intestinal microbiota. And by the way, mash feed will force the bears to spend more time eating. And this is important because they will not, won't have time to perform or to uh, behave with an indecisible uh, behavior, like pecking again, again. Gizar is considered the piece maker regulates the particles entering in the intestine is a kind of sieving bigger particles will not enter in the intestine as long as the size of these particles are reduced also the energy of our diet is correlated with the gizzard size or relative size of the gizzard based on the body weight or whatever measure okay that means that if we have a, a good gizzard well-developed, the use of the nutrients will be higher 
and the, and the, and the, and the energy, uh, metabolic cellular energy of the diet will be also higher. Using also coarse particles of insoluble fiber might have an impact because the retention time will be longer. And as long as the nutrients are in contact with different fluids in the geyser, exogenous, endogenous enzymes, chloridic acids, and so on, the good health might be enhanced. Also, a well-developed geyser will improve reverse peristalsis, which is, a, by the way, is also improving the stability of our diet. The fit format has an influence on pH. And we can see in this, in this example with the bullets, bullets with 16 weeks old, of 16 weeks old, that has no impact on the crop pH, but at the, at the same time, we can see a reduction in the pH of the proven triples with using coarse particles or coarse grinding of our diet instead of fine grinding. And the same we can see in the geyser by lowering the pH of the, these two uh, organs of the digestive tract or the foregood, we are in some extent keeping in balance the pathogenic bacteria because low pH is affecting the development of this pathogenic bacteria. In the same, at the same time, when compared with broilers, we can see that as long as the broilers are affected, are affected when talking about daily gain between one and 21 days, are affected by the inclusion of crude fiber, diet doesn't. And the same we can see when talking about feed efficiency between one and 21 days. When broilers are, while broilers are affected, lying hens are not. And this is reflecting the capacity that the lying hens from the very beginning for the bullet a period uh, has to deal with fiber, fibrous uh, ingredients. But when talking about fiber, we need to consider which fraction or which kind of fiber we have, because there are many definitions. And when talking about this crude fiber, structural fiber, we're always talking about natural detergent fiber as a good indicator of the insoluble fiber, which is the one we're always looking for to support this digestive tract development, feed intake capacity, and so on. But also, this good fiber, the good fiber content of the different raw materials by, by, may relay on the changes with the season, the wine type, and so on. Insoluble fiber has different roles and has been always associated with structural fiber. It's always preferable in course and cross structure, cross presentations. It depends on the inclusion level, physical chemical properties, the, the kind of diet and the raw materials we're using. It improves the geyser functionality, as we mentioned before, because it increases the retention time. It provokes a higher hydrochloric secretion, which is improving nutrient digestibility, especially protein digestibility and killing bacteria in the foregood, reduces the small intestine land, which is associated with a healthy gastrointestinal tract, reduces the fecal moisture, which in some places is always preferred. We're talking about non-fermentable fiber, so we, are, we will not provoke any undesirable fermentation in the distal part, and also improves the behavior because it forces birds spending more time eating. And this is an example on how fiber, and in this case, you can see a control diet, a diet with 3% rice hulls, and a diet with 6% rice hulls. And you can see the effect of these different inclusion levels of the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum morphology in the form of the muscular sterna width. Okay. As long as we increase this raw material inclusion, you can see a higher width, specifically in the duodenum, is, is, uh, is uh, significant, significant, and also in the ileum. So with the crude fiber, the insoluble crude fiber, we are improving. We can support a good, uh, a good, uh, a good intestinal uh, morphology. 
and also we can see the effect of different crude fiber sources on microbiota. In that case, in this work, we can see that including 3%, sorry, 5% of all holes reduce the crop lactobacillus significantly versus sugar pet pop. And the same at the Zika, but not significant, sorry, significantly. But when analyzing the Zika costidium per population, the inclusion of 5% of hot holes is improving, is reducing the concentration of this bacteria and also the content of the Zika enterobacteria versus the sugar pet pulp. So we can modify, we can support, we can affect the development of the different bacteria populations by the inclusion of the right good fiber source. But also, there is an influence of the structure of the gastro on the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes, crumbs or pellets are used to prepare our best. In fact, during reading is a good tool to improve the body weight gain and feed conversion rate because it increases the feed intake, avoids this particle selection and feedback stash, and also improves the uniformity of the block. Okay? But when these crumbs or pellet has or have a low quality, can lead to anti-consumptions. So instead of improving, we can worse, worse the effect of these uh, or these feed formats. Because at the end, we'll produce, we'll produce more fine particles, bullets will select, and this will drive also a lower, or will lead to a lower uniformity. And at the same time, when pelleting or cramps, uh, cramping our feet doesn't or don't allow the inclusion of coarse carbonate particles, okay, which is not favoring the actual quality. So as a rule of thumb, we need to check always the feed at our farm using the different sieves, sieve systems we have. And as long as 60, between 60 and 7% of our particles are between one and 2.5 millimeters of diameter, we know, we will know that the feed has the right destruction and the right distribution particles. By the way, also comes a pellets means less time for eating, as you can see in this example, when birds are spending half time when eating mass versus pellets. And this is always avoiding undesirable behaviors. As an example, here we have the optimal or the recommend, or recommendation for an optimal feed structure in mesh. You can see that always we need to avoid the streams. I mean, as long as we can, reducing the amount of particles lower than one millimeter of diameter and reducing as much as possible the number of particles about three millimeters. Optimally, for a lying hand feed, these values should be lower than 25% for uh, one millimeter diameter of particles and lower than 10% or the three, those particles are about three millimeters. We need to concentrate in between two and one millimeters. Then we will avoid verse selecting particles that might trigger unevenness of our flock. On the right side of the screen, we can see particles, real samples of the feed structure of different feed factors here in Europe. And then you can see that let's say that 60, 70% of particles, as we described before, are between one and three millimeters of diameter. Then we will select, we will avoid this verse selecting with this minimum amounts of feet we have, about three millimeters or below one millimeter. So, strategies, nutritional strategies to maintain a good, good health like always is better to prevent. So it means controlling our raw materials in terms of quality, management and hygiene, 
of our raw materials also in our feed factories using free organic acids or uh, selecting different suppliers if possible. Water is always important, is the forgotten nutrient. And the quality of the water is also important to prevent any disease. Using vaccination or coccidiostats that might reduce coccidiosis episodes. Reducing the protein level because it also reduces the fermentation of the distal part of the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, here is always recommending to use synthetic amino acids because it will help up and will support that as in the reduction of the, um, of the crude protein level. And in terms of additives, the use of enzymes based on the raw materials we are using, pro and prebiotics, symbiotics, organic minerals, sessionals, etc. Any kind of additive that may help us with the rest of the tools we mentioned to support an optimal good health of our hands. That's all. I hope this uh, presentation was useful. And now uh, I will give you the opportunity, will give you the opportunity to make any questions you might have. Thanks for your attention. Hello, my name is Dr. Ian Rubinoff. I am the Global Director of Technical Services for Highline International. And today, it is my pleasure to share my webinar, Achieving Success and Managing Disease Challenges in Antibiotic-Free Flocks, in coordination with EW Nutrition. For a quick introduction, I want to go over the challenges and successes that we have for managing antibiotic-free flocks. And really, in order to achieve success, we must be proactive. Additionally, even though I'm going to be talking about the managing disease component of this webinar, there are many, many management and nutrition and equipment choices that we must have correct in order to successfully manage an antibiotic-free flock. Not only do we need to protect flocks from bacterial diseases through excellent intestinal health and vaccination, we also need to manage viral issues that may increase the risk of secondary bacterial infection. Therefore, a holistic approach of management, vaccination, nutrition, and biosecurity is necessary to obtain the best results. Around the world, we are seeing a reduction in antibiotic usage in all farmed animals, and especially in poultry. This trend started in Europe, and now it is moving across to the rest of the world. In the USA, we have seen a huge increase in broilers that have gone no antibiotic ever, or NAE. As you can see, in 2015, only about 13% of flocks were considered antibiotic free. By 2019, up to 58% of flocks were already antibiotic free. For antibiotics in laying hens, different regions are moving at different paces. In Europe, Legislation will ban all routine and preventative use of antibiotics in farm animals by 2022. In the USA, in addition to the consumer-led demand, the Veterinary Feed Directive has greatly restricted the number and amount of antibiotics allowed for use. And additionally, we are already starting to see changes in antibiotic use in China. When this is done incorrectly, this may lead to welfare challenges. As a veterinarian, we have a moral and ethical obligation to help animals from suffering. If we are unable to treat for common bacterial pathogens using antibiotics, this can create a huge welfare problem. However, we must also acknowledge that across the feathered sectors, 
antibiotics have also been overused by the poultry industry for many, many years. So therefore, in order to prevent welfare challenges, we must be proactive to prevent peritonitis and other common bacterial issues and other viral issues as well. So what does antibiotic-free production look like? First of all, we are very honored to have a great partner in EW Nutrition making a variety of different products. Whenever we are working with antibiotic-free flocks, there are four general classes that I like to consider. The first and foremost are essential oils. There are a variety of essential oils available on the market, and all of these can very much help with intestinal health, with overall flock health, and really improving proactively the production of your flock. We also work with probiotics, with prebiotics, and with organic acids. The common theme for all four of these classes, however, though, is none of them really work as a treatment. They all must be utilized proactively, otherwise we will not achieve the best success. Even though we will not spend much time on this, management is also a critical component in helping with an antibiotic-free flock. Cleaning and disinfection of flocks before they come in is critical, as well as keeping the house clean, making sure there is minimal level of dust, and especially that the water lines and fans are kept clean. For water line sanitation, this is something that in our experience is one of the easiest and most critical components for managing an antibiotic-free flock. Using acids, using hydrogen peroxide, or other legal sanitizers that you can use with birds in the flock must be done at least on a weekly basis, if not more frequently. And then we already mentioned environmental control, which would really mean managing your dust levels. The last level is vaccination. And we're gonna talk about that in a few slides. Antibiotic free starts in the hatchery. In Europe, Oceania, parts of Asia and Latin America, most hatcheries are already antibiotic free. And every year we see fewer and fewer regions using antibiotics for day old chicks. While this is possible, it creates more urgency and work for all of the parent stock distributors and all of the hatcheries that you will be receiving your chicks from. In order to have an antibiotic free hatchery, everyone must pay a little bit closer attention, starting with the producer. For when you receive the chicks, you have to really have everything in very good condition. Your expectations on seven day livability must be adjusted. And all of the breeding companies must pay closer attention to their parent stock health, their egg sanitation, and all of their hatchery cleaning and disinfection practices. This is a study that I did with some hatcheries in Europe looking at the average day old chick mortality, well really the seven day mortality, over the year. And we see that up to 1% was not uncommon. Now most of these flocks were cage free and cage free flocks can be prone to a little bit higher mortality at times. However, just because we are not using antibiotics doesn't mean we have to accept higher mortality. My colleagues in Japan are very, very good at starting chicks. And we see that the average seven day livability without antibiotics averages around 0.2%. Now, it is very important in order to get only 0.2% mortality that you must be able to have everything very clean, 
and that you do a very strong selection of eggs in the hatchery so you don't get dirty eggs coming through and you don't have bad chicks coming through. And with that capability, we're able to see excellent livability in highline birds. So in order for us to have antibiotic-free chicks, first of all, we start with good quality from the hatchery. We must pay extra attention to the feed, the light, the air, and the water. I particularly like this setup here for the chicks. This is a good starting chicks. These chicks just arrived. And we can see there's a light inside the cage, which is critical to help the chicks see the nipple drinkers. The feed lines are full and they've spilled out onto the side. And the temperature was around 35 degrees centigrade. We must have all of these things put together in order for us to have the best approach to starting chicks. Additionally, we must have a good proactive approach to our nutrition and we must make an excellent vaccination plan which is region specific and counters for all of the disease challenges those chicks might face. Then we must deliver healthy pullets to the lay farm. We grow pullets in many different scenarios from inside floor pens to conventional cages to conventional floor houses in the tropics. And then once we're on the layer farm, the systems matter. It will always be easier to raise antibiotic free birds in very good, clean, well-ventilated houses with minimal dust. And this farm is doing a particularly good job managing these birds. And you can see how clean the house looks. And you can see that the birds look healthy and they've gotten off to a very good start. We still have many open-sided houses around the world. And while this is a common method for rearing birds and for having birds in lay, open-sided houses are just more difficult to manage. First of all, you cannot control the light nearly as much. Second of all, you have a lot more access of pathogens. It's harder to keep wild birds out. It's harder to keep rodents out. And so because of the additional exposure to pathogens and the difficult management for the environment, it's a little bit more difficult to manage this as an antibiotic free house. So now let's talk a little bit more about managing diseases without antibiotics. The first and most important thing for me is to vaccinate. The second most important thing is to maintain intestinal health. Let's start with viral issues. I like to group these into a few different categories. And the first one is diseases we can vaccinate for and can sometimes reasonably control. This would include your avian metanumaviruses, your avian paramyxoviruses, your fowl pox, infectious bronchitis, infectious bursal disease, infectious laryngotracheitis, and rheovirus. Diseases that we can vaccinate for, but may not be able to reasonably control, include avian influenza, Newcastle disease, infectious bronchitis, and viral enteric infections, such as astrovirus, parvovirus, rotavirus, or avian nephritis virus. You'll notice that avian influenza, or at least Newcastle disease, and infectious bronchitis are on both lists. And that's because depending on the strain, Sometimes we can control it, and sometimes we can't. For bacterial diseases, some of these diseases we're able to vaccinate for, and some of them we can't. And they would include avian intestinal spirochetosis, campylobacteriosis, cholebacillosis, foul cholera, infectious coryza, mycoplasmosis, ornithobacteriosis, and salmonellosis. 
you could see here, this is a picture of some free range swine in the UK. And if there are any chickens nearby, they're probably going to become infected with spirochetes because of the shedding from the hogs. So we must always be careful what other animals might be around that could spread diseases to our chickens. For parasitic diseases, we must always consider nematodiasis, coccidiosis, and histamoniasis. Coccidiosis in particular is a very critical one, especially for free range birds, because we must always try to maintain the best intestinal health. And if we do not have good intestinal health, whether it's from coccidiosis or whether it's from a nematode infection, then there will be more of a chance for bacterial diseases to be able to leak through the intestinal wall and get into the bloodstream. In many of the organic flocks in USA and in Europe, we have found that the better the attention we pay to coccidiosis control and to worm control, the better the results of our flocks. Now, I want to talk about the importance of vaccination. We're gonna talk about bird health, food safety regulations, and antibiotic-free production. For bird health, peritonitis and other bacterial syndromes can cause persistent and or high mortality. When we look at the mortality curve of flocks around the world, after 60 to 70 weeks, we usually see an increase in mortality. As birds have been laying for over a year at that time, their immune systems may be a little bit low and bacterial diseases can really create some challenge. Additionally, if we are working with multi-age farms, it is very difficult to manage any of the persistent production diseases such as mycoplasma, E. coli, bronchitis. And then as we move to aviary, pasture and free range systems in the US, Europe and around the world, because the birds have access to litter, as you see here, and the houses are likely to be more dusty, we always have a little bit more of a challenge. For vaccines, particularly for bacteria, many pathogenic bacteria only have inactivated vaccines available where we have to inject the birds. There is no capacity for mass application. Additionally, in order to gain the best efficacy, a bacterin must be administered twice. There are some live bacterial vaccines, such as mycoplasma vaccines and E. coli vaccines. And especially for the mycoplasma vaccines, these need to be eye or nose drop for best efficacy to ensure that every bird receives the right titer. However, many commercial producers would prefer to only handle birds once. In other areas of the world, such as in China, where vaccine programs are very strong and many killed vaccines, especially for avian influenza, must be administered, it is a little easier to add some of these handling vaccines into the program. However, it's a little bit difficult to manage to fit that in where you can not impact the bird too much. For vaccine benefits, even with application and efficacy difficulties, bacterial vaccines are very beneficial. Reduction of mortality, even in flocks with antibiotic access, can be quite dramatic. We have seen the benefits of introducing E. coli vaccines, both the live and the killed, for many years now. And this should be considered standard for any flock looking to go antibiotic free.
autogenous vaccines, especially for bacteria, are also a possibility. These are used with fairly high frequency in the USA for salmonella. And they're used in other countries, but more frequently for enterococcus, for E. coli, for cholera, or for coryza. And especially if we're looking to manage salmonella, autogenous salmonella vaccines are critical in countries where a multi-serotype vaccine is not available. There are some advantages to Bactrans. First of all, this provides homologous protection for wild strains. Many vaccines are able to protect a little bit and have some cross protection on the bacterial side. But many, many vaccines work best if they're with the homologous strain of what is actually affecting your flock. They can also provide strong protection against multiple phage types for salmonella. They have a long duration of immunity. And certainly they would be considered stronger protection than from live vaccines. And certainly with the combination of these last two, for flocks that are now going to 85, 90, and 95 weeks, we must have a vaccine that will last throughout that long learning period. For disadvantages of vaccines, first of all is the cost of bird handling. Even if that is in your normal vaccine program, every time you have to pick up a bird, not only does it actually cost to pay the labor, but it also costs in terms of losing body weight and in the stress that you put on the bird. We have the cost of the vaccine as well. In the US, it would be about 40 to $90 per thousand doses which would be around 280 to 630 RMB. Of course, vaccine costs in China will be a little bit different and your local veterinarian would have the best answer for that. The post-vaccination tissue reaction and stress on the birds is something that we must always consider. This is an excellent example of the caseous mass from inflammation that caused from improper injection. And we can lose one week of growth or more without the proper nutritional adjustment for a killed vaccine. Some additional disadvantages of Bactrians include some residual lesions at processing for end of lay hens. In areas where there's a strong end of lay market, this is not such a big issue. In other areas of the world where the end of lay hens are not with a very high value, uh, the factor in presence in the muscle can create a challenge. We also see in some cases that bacterins from the lipopolysaccharide or LPS can cause extreme immune reactions causing mortality. And we see this, uh, this liver that does not look very good, sometimes from either the crew injecting the liver directly or just from the immune stress from the LPS. And then in particular for the food safety and for the bird health area, vaccination alone cannot eradicate salmonella or other bacterial diseases such as E. coli. That requires a constant and holistic approach. However, bacterial vaccines overall have a very important role to play in the future of poultry production. My feeling is that bacterial vaccination is absolutely necessary for production without antibiotics. And really some of the areas that we have a lot to learn are understanding the role of live bacterial vaccines on the intestinal microbiome and helping to control disease and feed control, feed conversion uh, with the vaccines and with other products such as the essential oils. And then overall, maintaining systemic, intestinal, and human health throughout all of this process. My thoughts on where we are going for the future of bacterial vaccines are that we need a variety of strains. Currently, for some areas, such as E. coli, 
there's only one manufacturer for a live vaccine and it is from one strain. And one of the greatest needs we have are multiple strains for E. coli and also multiple strains for some of these other bacteria that are causing a lot of issues. We need to have increased utilization of gene technology in order to increase the immunogenicity of vaccines without the risk of reversion to virulence. We don't want to create a bacterial version of what we have with infectious laryngotracheitis, where we can have a very strong reversion to virulence when we vaccinate poorly. We also need to create vaccines that are efficacious with mass vaccination and do not need to be individually administered. This stress and time consuming aspect of individual vaccination is something that we need to move away from and try to go towards mass uh, application. We also need to research more efficacious adjuvants for inactivated vaccines. And hopefully we will improve technology and develop vectored bacterial vaccines, which can also be mass applied. Now, I want to show you two case studies of antibiotic-free flux for challenges and two case studies of successful antibiotic-free flux. One of the biggest challenges that we deal with around the world is a disease called focal duodenal necrosis. While this is likely caused by Clostridium perfringens, we have yet to fully understand the full process of this disease. It creates issues with absorption in the intestine. And as you can see, you really can't imagine absorbing very many nutrients through the duodenum with this kind of lesion. And this results in egg weight and production drops, but fortunately rarely causes mortality. This was a farm I worked with in the United States that the intention was to have this flock as an antibiotic free flock for its whole life. The flock came in late, never peaked, and then dropped back down. We are unable to get a proper egg weight, even though the feed consumption was normal and the mortality was normal. Unfortunately, we had to start this flock on antibiotics and we saw a huge jump in production almost immediately upon starting. This was an example where not enough proactive measures were started. We should have started back when the chicks arrived, preparing the intestinal health with all of the classes of proactive materials that we discussed before. And we probably did not start enough when the birds came into production. This is an example of what focal duodenal necrosis does to the intestine. And you can see this is a huge layer of necrosis and blood cells and immune cells that are all coming out of the intestines of the villi. And these villi are completely incapable of absorbing any nutrients leading to the loss in egg weight and to the loss in production. My next case study is one on spiroketosis. This was an organic flock and we ran into a spiroketosis problem. Brachospira intermedia and Brachospira pilosicoli are both common on layer complexes in the USA and around the world. The challenge with spiroketosis is it is found even in flocks that are not showing any clinical signs. So it can be difficult to understand when it is causing a problem and when it is not. And there is no vaccine at this time for spiroketosis. It can be caused, it can cause a nonspecific enteritis, dyspecteriosis, and malabsorption. In this stain over here, you can see the little spirochete bacteria embedded into the walls of the cecum. This is the performance chart of the flock that had 
spiroketosis. You can see we came into production late. We never peaked and we fell back down. Again, this may have been the environment or this may have been a lack of fraction. And when we did necropsy, we found very foamy cica that were looking like this. And again, this makes it difficult for the bird to absorb the last little bit of nutrients from the cica. And whenever you have a dysbacteriosis, usually indicated by spiroketosis and this foamy uh, filling of the cica, we may run into more problems and the birds will not be efficient or produce nearly as well. Fortunately, we also have some success stories. This is a flock that I worked with in the UK. That was an excellent flock that was organic. You can see here, the birds came into production a little bit later, but this was merely due to trying to get a larger egg weight. This flock then persisted out past 55 weeks above 90% production. And even though they were a little bit behind at the start, because of the holding back the birds to get a bigger egg, they caught up to the egg production standard. And by the end of the flock, after 80 weeks, was above the standard for eggs per hen house. And for our final flock today, this was another excellent flock from Japan. And this one was also antibiotic free. This flock came into production very nicely, dropped down a little bit, but then persisted very, very strongly out until 70 weeks. And this flock is still ongoing. What we see, again, is with all of the antibiotic-free flocks, we are more prone to these dips and recoveries because we don't have the capacity to instantly administer any medications. Well, this one here is probably an egg collection error. The difference between these two flocks, you see you have these little waves and swirls of production. And again, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of preparation to be able to manage these flocks as well as we can without antibiotics. So how did they do it? First of all, we need excellent pullet body weights. Good body weight birds will almost always be healthy. And this is also indicative of good intestinal development. We need to be above standard by six weeks of age because that is the time during which the intestinal system is developing the most. If we are above body weight standard by six weeks of age, we will be able to have a good intestine, good body weights, and we will be able to withstand all of the bacterial challenges that we can face as well as possible. We need to have conscientious nutrition. First of all, consistent feed ingredients are helpful. The less we move the raw ingredients in our rations around, the less our birds will have to adapt their intestinal microbiome to the different feedstuffs. In order to have the best production, we must fit the nutrition to the bird and listen to what the bird is telling us. We have good intestinal health. I come back to that again and again, because without good intestinal health, we really can't have good overall health. And then of course, we need good overall health because if the birds are have any challenges, we are not gonna be able to treat them. So in order to manage our best antibiotic free flocks, we really must have a holistic approach to health and keep the birds as healthy and as productive as possible. That is our webinar for today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. Right now, it is very important to make considerations in regards with the recent AGP ban in China. And this is where our topic takes us today. 
China is not the first country to ban AGPs in annual fee. Thus, a lot can be learned with experience of other countries and regions. Outlined in the webinar, we will start talking about the general reason behind a ban of AGPs and summarize some experiences. One of them, a study from Canada, that will give us an overview of a not successful experience in terms of animal health and performance. The example of the Netherlands will give us an idea of what it takes to be successful in lowering the use of antimicrobials, not only AGPs in animal production, and at the same time, keeping the performance and profitability of the operations. The non-antibiotic ever meat production in the US provides an example of lowering antibiotics due to retailers and consumer pressures. And which actions have the integrators in the US taken to comply with these demands? Finally, we will check some considerations for feeding broilers that have been implemented by operations that have successfully lowered antibiotics in broiler production. Let's start with the why. Misuse of antibiotics in food animals contributes to an increase of antibiotic resistant genes transmission to humans. Data from 96 countries is summarized here in terms of antibiotic resistant genes found in waste from livestock animals. Waste treatment processes do not completely remove antibiotic resistant genes and they can be released to soil and water environments. Let's consider that most of the antibiotics used in animal production are from non-therapeutic reasons, such as growth promotion and disease prevention. This exerts selective pressure for bacteria in the digestive system of livestock to acquire and maintain this antibiotic resistant gene. The chicken production industry is related with higher abundances of resistant genes. Each color here represents a type of resistance and the lower variability that we see implies a constant use of antibiotics. China harbored the highest absolute abundance of antibiotic resistant genes in this study. For us as people involved in animal protein production, it is also important to understand that our workers are exposed to increased risk of carrying multi-resistant bacteria. This is an overview of uh, three studies that uh, looked into the relative exposure of poultry workers to resistant bacteria like MRSA, cholestin-resistant E. coli, and ESBL-producing E. coli. Compared with the general population, the presence of resistant bacteria in a poultry workers is higher. And the last study also looked into carryover of antimicrobial resistance from poultry workers onto their family members. In other words, if you are a poultry production worker, the risk that your family is exposed to antimicrobial resistance is increased. These are of course good reasons to lower the use of antibiotics in animal production. Actions have been taken by several countries and regions like Europe. Therefore, it is up to us to check the actions that have been already taken, adapt them as there is no one size fits all solution, um, evaluate them and create from that, our own successful strategies. Let's take a look at uh, some of this experience with uh, the story from Canada. Today, Canada has uh, banned category one and category two antibiotics, the ones considered of uh, high importance for, all, for human health. Uh, they have banned them from poultry production and category three antibiotics will be forbidden in broiler production at the end of this year. Other actions uh, that Canada has taken are the continuous monitoring of antimicrobial resistance, 
and the monitoring as well of antimicrobial use and the control of antimicrobial use and also making awareness uh, about these issues in the general population but more especially in animal production units. Other actions is in regards to making research to find alternatives that allow an efficient production without antibiotics. Uh, as is uh, the topic of uh, this study. Removing antibiotic growth promoters and antioxidants was the subject of uh, this one with 1.5 million broilers. The interventions that were attempted there uh, were the use of a vaccine for coccidiosis, a general improvement in uh, air brooding conditions, the use of uh, a phytogenic or essential oil-based uh, feed additives, and uh, the acidification of uh, the water. The 1.5 million broilers of the study were divided into five farms, six production periods, and 102 flocks of uh, around uh, 15,000 broilers each. The conventional production included the use of coccidiostats and antibiotic growth promoters. The drug-free animals were vaccinated with a non-attenuated coccidiosis vaccine. And of course, uh, no AGPs were used. The results show a lower a daily a gain and a higher feed conversion rate for the drug free group. But more importantly, we can see in the health parameters that there was a higher incidence of both clinical and subclinical necrotic enteritis in the drug free group. Um, the lack of severe vaccination might have contributed uh, to the higher incidence of necrotic enteritis, of course. Uh, but we also need uh, to see that uh, no changes in nutrition or in management uh, were evaluated after the first uh, days. For this extensive study, uh, then uh, we can conclude that removing AGPs and coccidial stats is a big challenge, and uh, that uh, to be successful in uh, keeping good performance parameters uh, requires a multidisciplinary approach and several interventions. Let's now go to Europe and specifically to the Netherlands. In 2019, the discovery of uh, an ubiquitous presence of ESBL producing bacteria on poultry meat, and with that, uh, the possibly relationship with a human casualty. And of course, the noise uh, that this uh, made into the media led to very serious uh, public concerns that raised awareness on antimicrobial resistance due to overuse and misuse of antibiotics in animal production. As a result, um, the government uh, defined uh, targets uh, for anti production of antimicrobial use in farm animals. So 50% of reduction by 2013 and 70% of reduction by 2017 compared with the levels of 2009. A system uh, was also introduced, um, uh, uh, so uh, veterinary uh, practices were linked to one group of farmers. This uh, uh, with the purpose of reducing competition between veterinaries and to increase the accountability on a, a farm a health and performance of the veterinarians as well. Also, a more a monitoring or surveillance a, was a, taken, and for that, a system um, of uh, monitoring and an independent monitoring institution was created, the, the Netherlands Veterinary and Medicines Authority. Um, it is a public and private at the same time partnership a, to collect and report data, uh, including, of course, uh, some uh, benchmark uh, indicators um, uh, that uh, differentiate between moderate, high, and very high users in terms of antimicrobials. Uh, in this case, the farmers, and of course, also it monitors prescribers, in this case, the veterinarians. 
So high users and prescribers can be subject to sanctions. And this, of course, emphasizes a lot the role of veterinary practitioners in antibiotic production. What has happened? Well, uh, let's uh, make a little bit of history and mention that both antibiotic use and antimicrobial resistance have been monitored in the Netherlands for almost 20 years. How? By uh, checking commensal, commensal non-pathogenic E. coli bacteria, they are isolated uh, from the Zika of slaughtered birds, in this case broilers, and culture. This is an ideal indicator to quantify the occurrence of antimicrobial resistance in the gut environment. And uh, this includes uh, also an indirect um, surveillance of uh, antimicrobial resistant pathogens as bacteria easily exchange antimicrobial resistant genes. The columns here uh, show the therapeutic use of antibiotics under a veterinary prescription. And uh, we can see that in preparation for the 2006 AGP ban, the therapeutic antibiotic use increased. However, through the legislative pressure uh, that was already mentioned, antibiotic use in production animals dropped 63% uh, from uh, 2009 to 2017. Remember that the goal was 70%, so 63% is still an impressive achievement. As a consequence, uh, antimicrobial resistance was reduced by 50% across different classes of antibiotics, as shown with the lines. Um, uh, also, the frequency of um, resistant genes uh, has been lowered. For example, ESBL producing E. coli was found only in 20% of the sample animals in 2018, compared with 65 that were found in 2014. Then, um, once bacteria are not being challenged with antibiotics, eventually they will phase out these antimicrobial resistant genes and become susceptible again. An improved response to necessary antibiotic treatment in the broiler flocks has also been reported. Um, but uh, what have they done? Which were the actions that they have taken? Well, when veterinary practitioners uh, didn't uh, uh, prescribe uh, much antibiotics uh, because they had much pressure to reduce the antibiotic use, then farmers started to understand that optimal housing and hygiene practices, climate control, and feed and water quality were major prerequisites for the animal production and the reduction of antimicrobial use in farm animals. Um, so minimizing the incidence of disease was the objective of the farmers. So they started by improving vaccination programs and also adopted strict biosecurity measures. Uh, for example, including uh, the use of all-in and all-out systems, um, improving uh, feed uh, and water quality, improving uh, management practices, and of course, also nutrition and uh, feed quality uh, played a big role in uh, the Dutch antibiotic production success. Um, also, this included the use of feed additives aiming to prevent health issues, especially gut health issues. Um, it is uh, very important to mention uh, some motivation aspects uh, of the farmers uh, who, uh, for example, uh, through education um, and awareness uh, led to improvement in health and uh, this uh, led to an improvement in performance uh, a critical evaluation of uh, their antimicrobial usage was also playing a role here. And of course, uh, uh, without obtaining uh, economical benefits, uh, the farmers uh, wouldn't uh, continue uh, to do this. Um, uh, this is an example. This is the, the study of other European countries, very, very close to the Netherlands. Uh, showing the relationship between a biosecurity-related questionnaire from the University of Ghent 
and a broiler performance and antibiotic use in the farms. The questionnaire was applied a first time um, and an action plan was generated and implemented. One year later, a second time um, the questionnaire was applied again and uh, a biosecurity uh, improved. In general, as well, mortality and feed conversion rate uh, also were better after the second score, as well as uh, uh, the European production index. But also very remarkable is uh, to mention uh, that the antibiotic use was reduced in uh, 29%. What are the outcomes? Then uh, for the Netherlands so far. Well, first, uh, when they started with this journey, it was speculated that a reduction in antimicrobial use might be accompanied with higher production cost per unit. But the industry instead increased efficiency by improving farm and management conditions. Uh, when uh, they improve the efficiency, the incidence of disease is reduced. And so is also the use of antimicrobials. At the same time, other indirect disease associated costs were avoided. So in summary, uh, what is needed? Uh, what is, is needed is uh, a proper coordination between farmers and veterinarians. So it is crucial uh, in this case uh, for the reduction of uh, antimicrobial use. However, and we can see that still there are some remaining issues, mainly gut health related uh, in a, a broiler production, and these issues, of course, need to be readdressed and further researched. We have seen that the public pressure took part in the antibiotic production study uh, from the Netherlands. Um, but for this, uh, movement uh, in the US, it is the main driver of uh, the non-antibiotic ever labeling. In 2019, many of uh, the uh, fast food restaurants change uh, famous in the US source their meat from a non-antibiotic ever broiler production. At the end of 2019, and then uh, we can see that 58% of the broilers produced in the US were under a non-antibiotic ever production scheme. And only 25% uh, uh, of the producers went for the full spectrum uh, antibiotics. At the end of 2019, 58% uh, of the broilers produced in the US were under a non-antibiotic ever scheme. And uh, only 3% uh, uh, went for the use of uh, the full spectrum of antibiotics. It has not been an easy journey uh, for integrators and producers, but with the aid of uh, uh, different measures, uh, among them, uh, for example, um, uh, the uh, use of a lower stocking density, um, uh, the use of uh, coccidiosis vaccine, and um, uh, the use of uh, a higher uh, downtime. And these measures uh, are taken by 70 to 80 percent of the main integrators uh, interviewed uh, for these studies. Also, other measures implied and these were taken by 100% uh, of uh, these integrators. Um, uh, for example, the use of uh, feed additives into their formulation in order to prevent uh, health issues, and uh, as well, the implementation of uh, improved uh, management conditions. And this includes uh, biosecurity as well. So with uh, all of uh, these measures together, the non-antibiotic ever uh, production uh, could represent more than half of the production uh, of uh, broiler meat in the US in the last two years. But they still face challenges, especially uh, with the seasonal incidence uh, of uh, necrotic.
multiple factors of uh, commercial production can uh, then uh, trigger gut inflammation. As we see both in the Netherlands and in the US, gut health issues uh, are uh, one of the main triggers for the use of antimicrobials. Among these factors that trigger gut inflammation, we can find stomach density, poor quality food ingredients, high energy diets, uh, changes in food formulation, and intestinal pathogens. Let's remember that for years, the effects uh, of uh, uh, these factors were controlled by APs. But let's imagine today that we discontinue the use of AEPs and don't make any further changes into the broiler diets or into their environment. The first that we will notice is uh, at gut level an increase in microbial growth. For example, in commensal non harmful bacteria and as well as in pathogens. Both will increase their population. As this happens, an increase in fermentation of uh, carbohydrates and proteins will take place. And uh, uh, with that, uh, of course, an increase uh, of uh, fermentation products. Um, for example, the production of toxic amines and ammonia. On the other side, um, the increased uh, microbial populations uh, can transform bile salts. And uh, in this case, uh, the effect that we will see is a reduction in the digestion of fats. All of this uh, together will result in a loss of gut morphology and a lower performance and health of the animals. So, do we need AGPs? Well, of course not, but we need to take several actions uh, to keep the animals healthy and productive. We will now discuss uh, some of the actions in the context of broiler nutrition. Um, the first and most obvious action is to know our diet components as well as their quality. This has a direct uh, impact on uh, uh, gut health. Uh, for instance, uh, mycotoxin contaminated grains can deteriorate the barrier. Quality assurance needs to work closely with nutrition. Uh, feed the changes uh, in which nutrient density and inclusion of, of ingredients fluctuates will alter the microbiota and often uh, lead to dysbiosis. Thus, this should be avoided when formulated feed. Um, but the quality um, uh, animal proteins uh, should be avoided. So let's go to vegetarian diets. Um, because they contain biogenic amines, uh, rancid fats, and possibly clostridians, of course. However, there are, of course, a high quality animal proteins with high biological value. The right inclusion uh, rates uh, are also available of uh, essential amino acids. So, again, in this case, quality assurance needs to work together with the nutrition department. This uh, to put uh, some general examples, but continuing to check our diets, we need to take a look at having the right nutrient levels. Face feeding is very important for that. Um, deficiencies and excess uh, are of course uh, to be avoided, but the excess is uh, more frequent, at least at the uh, macro ingredient level or macronutrient level. A high concentration of unused nutrients in the gut, such as starch, fat, and protein, will benefit the microflora, but also leads to this bacteriosis because it also benefits pathogenic bacteria, and of course, it leads to a poor feed conversion. Crude protein then should be restricted and uh, it, uh, including air protein sources and needs to be highly digestible to minimize residual protein uh, reaching uh, the lower gut. We talked about the use of uh, all vegetable diets and uh, uh, this type of diets minimize uh, crude uh, protein uh, and uh, uh, of crude protein should be restricted. 
and the included protein should be highly digestible to minimize residual protein reaching the lower gut. We talked about the use of all vegetable diets. These type of diets make protein restriction difficult. Therefore, synthetic amino acids are most. As illustrated, the protein bypassing the small intestine uh, can be resistance uh, protein of uh, a dietary origin, uh, can be microbial protein, and it can be a protein synthesized by the host. If uh, uh, the protein is highly digestible and amino acids are largely absorbed, and then the proportion of protein used by the animal is higher. Our actions to reduce the amount of ileal bypass protein will reduce also the production of toxic protein fermentation metabolites in the sick. So, for example, the use of enzymes that facilitate protein digestion and uh, that also uh, digest uh, soluble uh, carbohydrates resistant to ileal digestion will reduce a uh, cecal putrefaction. Uh, supplementation also with synthetic amino acids could spare 2 to 3% of dietary uh, protein, and of course, uh, that will uh, reduce uh, nutrient excretion. This interesting example shows the effects of uh, two protein levels um, uh, and the inclusion of amino acids for the uh, low uh, protein uh, levels in a good and in poor uh, sanitary conditions. And uh, this uh, was to measure the effects uh, of, all of, of all of these conditions in the performance of broilers. So first, performance was affected by protein level, being the lower uh, performance for the low protein diet, as reflected in a, a weight gain here and in a, a feed conversion rate as well. Keeping a low protein with the right amino acid balance pays off in better performance, as we can see also in the, in the performance of this group. Looking at the intestinal integrity, the gene expression of uh, tight junction proteins was higher for the low protein diets. This suggests a broken barrier that needs to be repaired. And uh, finally, the gut morphology in terms of the villus height and uh, of uh, a crypt uh, depth uh, was uh, also influenced uh, not only by the protein levels, but also by the sanitary conditions. In uh, poor uh, conditions, uh, we see that the performance was hindered regardless of the addition of amino acids in the, the low protein diet, which shows the importance of integrated strategies when uh, reducing HPs. Continuing uh, with uh, a diet composition, let's talk about fats and oils. First, let me say that oxidized or rancid fats and oils should be rejected since uh, they are related uh, with enteric disease. Second, their inclusion in uh, non-HP diets uh, can negatively affect gut health and performance. And in general, the inclusion of uh, uh, oils and fats in non-HP diets uh, can also be related to low performance. In the bar graph, uh, we can check how the inclusion of uh, a soybean oil increases a feed conversion rate both in AGP and in non-AGP situations. So feed conversion rate are the brown bars. Um, in comparison uh, with uh, the use of uh, only AGPs uh, without the inclusion of uh, soybean oil. Um, the inclusion of uh, feed additives uh, then uh, needs to be uh, careful as well. So for example, when we talk about probiotics, they may increase bacteria with a bile side hydrolase activity that lowers the digestion of fats and oils. 
And the line graph shows also that the presence of Clostridium perfringens in the ileum is first age dependent, but is also influenced by a soybean oil inclusion and antibiotic supplementation. Uh, both AGP groups have the lower count, which uh, uh, of course uh, can be linked to a better uh, gut health. Um, diverse feed additives uh, are an alternative uh, to inhibit, uh, for example, biocide hydrolases or the bacteria that produce them. Uh, in this case, we can think about riboflavin, which is a nutrient, and a certain uh, phytomolecules, for example. Um, enzymes uh, that uh, degrade anti-nutritional factors, uh, such as uh, uh, non-starch polysaccharides uh, in cereals, are beneficial in antibiotic uh, reduction programs. Their mode of action uh, is indirect when we talk about gut health. Uh, but uh, they do reduce the availability of substrate uh, to potentially harmful bacteria. So even if indirect, it is not less important. One of the key aspects uh, to improving intestinal uh, health in antibiotic production programs is uh, to have the appropriate uh, for gut digestion. And for that, with form and insoluble fiber are critical. Coarse grown uh, grains stimulate uh, the geyser development and uh, its function, and therefore they are recommended for all phases in mash and pellet diets. Another way to promote geyser development is also through the use of uh, moderate uh, quantities uh, of insoluble fiber. Both strategies aid in a modulating gut motility and in a modulating a feed passage as well. 30% um, um, of the feed uh, should uh, consist of particles uh, between 1 to 1.5 millimeters. One of the key aspects uh, to improve intestinal health in antibiotic production programs is uh, to have the appropriate uh, for gut digestion. For that, feed form and insoluble fiber inclusion are critical. So for example, coarse grown grains stimulate the geyser development. Geyser development is very important so it can comply with its function and therefore it is uh, recommended uh, to have coarse grown grains in all phases for mash and pellet feeds. Another way to promote a geyser development is uh, through the use of moderate inclusions of insoluble fiber. Both strategies aid in modulating gut motility and uh, feed passage into the intestine, resulting in a higher uh, nutrient uh, digestibility. Um, uh, so for example, uh, we can find that in the geyser, the feed will be better mixed with uh, acid and pepsin. And uh, uh, of course, uh, this will promote a better digestion, um, especially of proteins. Also, having um, a small particle size, so the contrary of what we are recommending right now, reduces a uh, time stay in the geyser, which uh, leads uh, to inefficient uh, protein uh, digestion, um, that having a higher quantity of protein in the hindgut which uh, uh, also uh, may uh, be uh, leading uh, to dysbiosis or dysbacteriosis. And at the end, uh, we will have uh, health issues and lower performance in the animal. This uh, is a summary of several studies uh, that show how the geyser weight in this uh, occasion, in, uh, shown in relative terms, increases by using coarse wheat or corn diets. All the bars show the increase in comparison with the control group. You, and the control group is uh, using fine uh, ground grains. So uh, in average, the gizzard of coarse uh, ground with diets is 10% bigger than the wines with fine wheat. And in the case uh, of corn, the increase is 15%. We can talk about nutrition uh, without talking about stress, as nutrition can be a contributing factor. 
stress alters the immune system, the microbiome, and of course, it lowers the health and performance. Um, but uh, uh, what can we do? Well, first, we need uh, to analyze the cause of stress and take informed decisions. In uh, many cases, a certain feed additives uh, also can help uh, to reduce stress in the animals. We have already talked about uh, these factors, but these factors uh, can also be nutritional stress factors in the context of improving gut health in antibiotic reduction scenarios. However, we have talked about them, but still it's worth to um, uh, uh, review the NSPs, uh, to review the role of oxidized fats, to review the imbalance of proteins and uh, mycotoxins. Why is that? Because after uh, several steps, they all lead to inflammation. And at some point, of course, they also lead to a leaky gut. Uh, so that's the loss of uh, intestinal barrier. How to prevent nutrition assurance uh, formulation and the inclusion of uh, feed additives are actions to be taken. Important to mention uh, that uh, feed additives with digestive, antioxidant, antimicrobial, and antimycotoxin actions are amongst the main factors of success in non AGP diets. Feed additives then improve gut integrity and they can have a direct effect in the microflora. And in general, they have an overall effect to improve gut health and uh, gut uh, function. They also may inhibit uh, pathogens. We have uh, many categories, uh, such as uh, phytogenics, also known as plant extracts or essential oils, which have diverse modes of action including, for example, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, digestive, and antimicrobial. Uh, we have, uh, a, as other category, direct pet microbials, uh, including probiotics. And these are very important, especially in the initial stages of the animals, uh, to avoid, for example, the colonization by the wrong uh, microbes in the intestine. And the product or a um, combination of products that depends on your circumstances. And repeating from the beginning of the presentation, there is no silver bullet and there is no one size fits all solution. Let us finish uh, taking a look at a summary of 11 studies done in different countries uh, such as uh, the US, um, uh, such as uh, Brazil, and uh, uh, we have also studies in Germany and uh, in China, in which a phytogenic feed additive was compared against non-antibiotic, uh, well, non-supplemented uh, animals uh, across a variety of diets, uh, both, uh, for example, a uh, corn and uh, wheat based, uh, depending on the location of the study. The results here are, are expressed in comparison with negative control groups. Um, so that means uh, the non-supplemental groups. Body weight gain is an average positively impact by uh, this feed additive uh, by 2%, and a feed conversion rate is reduced by 2.5% uh, as we see in the yellow bars. Thanks to the effect of the additives, uh, the gut is healthier and uh, it can be more efficient. And uh, therefore, we can find these improvements in performance. The same microencapsulated combination of five molecules has also been directly compared with antibiotic growth promoters, also in diverse environments. As uh, we can see, um, uh, some data from the US some data from India, from Brazil, and uh, from China. The results here are expressed as a percentage of the AGP supplemented a uh, group of broilers. So the additive can match the performance of uh, the most uh, commonly used uh, growth promoters under typical research conditions, indicated 
that uh, under best practice conditions, AGPs can be replaced by uh, this feed additive without a risk of performance loss. However, let's remember that uh, non-optimal conditions also require other factors uh, to be addressed to achieve the best results. What I hope we have learned from this webinar. Well, first, in general, the industry is moving away from antibiotic use. As antimicrobial resistance continues uh, to be an issue in uh, human health. So, if we want to achieve this, then we need to know our operations in order to plan multifactorial interventions. We need to put them into practice and we need to learn from the results. Nutritional interventions uh, are a very important part of this multifactorial plan and the use of feed additives, especially phytogenics, uh, promises relatively uh, effective results. Thank you for your attention um, and now I am happy to answer your questions.